All right, all right, all right. Good morning, Emmaus Church. Good morning. My name is Joe, and I just want to thank you guys again. I know you've heard it like seven times. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Um, It warms my heart to look out and see you all. And before I begin, I have one more announcement. I know you've heard like 800 of them, but I have one more. There is a, and because the youth, you all are in here, so listen up, youth, especially young ladies. On the 18th of February, there is a Galentine's Youth Breakfast, all right? This is going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. There's going to be fun food, fun decorations, fun games. Um, Sign-up sheet is out in the lobby at the information desk. I think it starts at 1030. I won't be there, obviously, but I want to encourage you young girls to come join in on the fun with the other gals, all right? Galentine's for the young ladies, 1030 on the 18th. Got it? Fantastic. And I used to be an intern here. I'm still kind of hanging out and just trying to enjoy my time here at Emmaus. Um, And we are a church here at Emmaus. If you are new or if you're visiting or if you're watching online, we are a church that likes to walk through books of the Bible very slowly. We like to walk through word by word, verse by verse, sometimes letter by letter. It just depends on what we got going on. And so today we're continuing our adventure through the gospel of Luke, right? And this morning you guys have the displeasure and I have the pleasure of being your tour guide for this sixth chapter, the first 11 verses. And as we pull our bus up to the sixth chapter, before we get out and take a look at all the sights and the sounds of what's going on in chapter six, um, I just want to do a quick, like the most unthorough recap you've ever heard of the first five chapters of Luke's gospel. Because I know some of you weren't paying attention over these last few weeks. Do you know why? Because the Jaguars were in the playoffs. And so y'all were distracted. Some of you missed Sunday. Some of you might have been traveling. And some of you, like, just don't pay attention even when you're here. So let me give you this quick, just completely unthorough recap. So, so far in Luke's gospel, we have heard about prophecies and watched how they were fulfilled. We heard about the birth of Jesus. We watched Jesus grow up. And we even saw some crazy story where Jesus' parents, is, they, they, they lost him in Jerusalem. Remember that? We heard that story. Um, we saw him get baptized. We saw him be tempted by the devil. We began reading about his public ministry. We heard about Jesus teaching in the synagogues and on the Sabbath. We read about him healing people who were sick or who had demons or who even were paralyzed and dropped through the roof of a building. And we even caught a few scenes of Jesus interacting with the ruffians of society, where he'd have dinner parties with the complete outcasts. And last week, we started and began to watch as Jesus assembled his crew with the most unlikely people. So there you go, the first five chapters of Luke in about 15 sentences really bad job. But we've also seen, and maybe you've noticed as as we have gone through these first five chapters, maybe you've noticed that there's this underlying current of tension that's going on in Luke's gospel. This underlying current between Jesus and the Pharisees, right? Between what Jesus does and what the Pharisees want Jesus to do. Now, I'm sure if you've been in church for more than two minutes, you know that the Pharisees are church people, They're scholars of the law. They're people who love church. They love everything about God's church and the synagogue. They love everything about it. So when Jesus shows up, they should be the ones who are the most excited that Jesus is here, right? The ones who are the absolute just on fire. They're jumping around. But instead, normally act. They're angry. They're upset. They're irritated. They don't like what Jesus is doing. And so this week, we are going to step into chapter 6. And this is a story that's not like all the other stories about Jesus. This is something where Jesus isn't telling a parable. He's about to get in a little scuffle with these Pharisees. And I love that Luke left us this story. I love that Luke left us because we get to see a side of Jesus we don't normally get to see. And I love this Jesus. I love how whimsical he is. I love how intentional he is. I love what he does. And so as we kind of look at it, it's going to be fun for us to watch this tension grow and to see how Jesus deals with it because he deals with it in a way that is completely different than the way you or I would deal with this kind of tension. But it's crazy, isn't it? Just when we think we know someone, they do something or say something that changes everything. My father passed away about 10 years ago. 
And I thought I knew my dad. But since his passing, I've gotten to know his best friend here on earth. And it was a best friend that he worked with. And this best friend has called me and told me stories about my dad, of my dad playing practical jokes, of my dad doing things that I never thought my dad would do, but it fits with inside of his character. And so I get this whole new appreciation of my dad through the stories of his best friend, even though my dad's gone. You know, literally the same thing happens all the time with my wife. Just when I think I know her, she says something, does something, or makes me laugh in a way that makes me fall in love with her all over again. That was sweet. There was Valentine's. It's coming, so <laughs> it's here. But that's the way it is, isn't it? Just when we begin to think we know someone, if we can take a step back and if we can take a look at what's really going on, we get to know them just a little bit better. And that's what's going to happen in this story with Jesus in these first 11 verses. We're going to get to step back and take a look at Jesus. And I promise you, if we slow down just enough, if we can stop our brains from racing into this tension between him and the Pharisees, I promise you, you're going to fall in love with Jesus all over again because of what he says and how he says it and what he does. But before we look at these first 11 verses, let's pray. Because we can't look at these in our own power. We need the Holy Spirit to come and bless us. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we come to you full of joy and expectation this morning. Father, we are excited to read these words about your son. Because they offer us such hope. Father, we heard the lies and we actually believed them that if we come to you and if we obey enough and if we give enough and if we try hard enough that you're going to love us. And Father, as we began to realize that there's no way we can do that, tears began to well in our eyes. And Lord, as we turned to walk away, we heard you say, welcome, child. And so we turned and we ran back and we fell into your arms, Heavenly Father. Father, I thank you that you are the God who knows all about sadness and pain. You're the God who knows the secrets we don't want to tell and the sins that we just can't seem to shake. You are the God of the rain and the tears and the sadness and suffering. But Father, you're also the God who loves to laugh and you love to hear your children laugh. For you are the God of the joy and the laughter. And so, Father, no matter where we are today in our walk, whether we're in sadness and darkness or we're in joy, I pray that you come and meet us right here and now. Send your Holy Spirit down to read these verses with us. Allow, them, allow us to see them with fresh eyes. Allow us to get a better picture of your Son. And as we do that, Lord, make me really small in the process so that your kids can see you and you alone. It is in your holy and precious Son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's take a look at these first 11 verses. We're going to read through them all in one big chunk, but as we read through them, you're going to see that it's kind of like two different distinct stories. We're going to get one story, there's going to be a little break, and then we're going to get another story. So let's read through it all, and then we'll talk about the first story. We'll take a little break, halftime, and then we'll talk about the second story. No Rihanna in the halftime show. Hate to break it to you. All right, here we go. Luke chapter, one verses, Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Luke writes, he says, on one Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples broke off the heads of grain and rubbed off the husks in their hand and ate the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, haven't you read the scriptures? What David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priest can eat. He also gave some to his companions. And Jesus added, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. On another Sabbath day, a man with deformed hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts. He said to the man with the deformed hand, come here and stand in front of everyone. And so the man came forward. Then Jesus told his critics, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save a life or to destroy it? He looked around at them one by one and then said to the man, hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand 
and it was restored. At this, the enemies of Jesus were wild with rage and began to discuss what to do with him. Awesome. It feels like when we read the Gospels, Jesus and the Pharisees are always getting into this, doesn't it? It feels like no matter what's going on, whatever Jesus does, the Pharisees don't like. And whatever the Pharisee says, Jesus kind of claps back at them in some sort of way to make them even angrier and just kind of gets them riled up more and more and more. Basically, when Jesus shows up, the Pharisees get their panties in a bunch. Okay? Now, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, Joe, like, look, we get it. We get Jesus and the Pharisees don't get along, and we like these stories. We like when Jesus puts these these guys in their place because they're just so petty, right? They're just so petty. How does this story allow me to see Jesus in a new light and fall in love with him? Well, let's take a look at this first exchange. Luke tells us that Jesus and his boys were walking through a field on the Sabbath. All right, today is our Sabbath. What are you all gonna do after church today? About 99.9% of you you're going to go eat. This is the exact same thing that Jesus and Peter and James and John were doing. They had left church, and guess what they were doing? They were walking through a field, and they were like, hey, we're hungry, and there's some stuff here, so let's start eating. Now, there are some scholars who argue that this is corn that they're eating, and just so you know, I completely disagree with eating raw corn. I think corn needs to be cooked with butter and salt. You don't eat it raw. So if that's what they're really doing, I'm not so sure. But anyway, they're walking through the field, and as they're hungry, they'd grab a husk of corn or a piece of wheat, and they'd kind of rub it in their hands, taking off the nuts or the kernels, and they'd throw them in their mouths and throw the husk on the ground. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? Sounds fantastic. And as they're doing this, all of a sudden, the Pharisees like pop up out of nowhere and they're like, aha, we've got you, right? And they ask what? They say what to Jesus? Why are you breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Now, let me ask you, is harvesting grain on the Sabbath a law that can be broken? You guys are nodding your heads up and down. And it is true right? So is Jesus breaking the law? I thought Jesus never broke the law. I thought Jesus obeyed everything completely and totally. So what's going on here? We got to pull this out. We got we to figure out what's happening. I promise you that Jesus is not breaking the law, okay? Keeping the Sabbath was one of the holy commandments. In fact, it's the number four. It's the fourth commandment. And you guys are like, I don't believe you. So let me come and show you. Go to Exodus 20. And let's read verses eight through 10. Right here, Exodus. Remember Moses is on the mountain. Here, God gives him this. He says, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days of a week for your ordinary work, but the seventh is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord. And on that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male, your female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living amongst you. That was it. There was nothing. There was no work. There was no doing nothing. You had to sit and rest and relax. Now, a few years ago, I went to Jerusalem. And on Jerusalem, I was in the city of Jerusalem on the Sabbath. And the way that the Jews today get around some of these Sabbath laws be, is, is that they kind of pre-automate things. And so I guess it's work to press a button in an elevator because they have what is called a Shabbat elevator. And this elevator stops on every single floor going up. So if you were a observing law, Sabbath observing law Jew, you'd walk into the Shabbat elevator and you'd go all the way up. Now, as an American, I had no idea about this. My hotel room was on the 34th floor. I thought the elevator was broken. And I didn't just do it once. I did it four times. Every floor, it kept opening and coming down. Right? The Pharisees feel like they've caught Jesus because, hey, Jesus, you broke the Sabbath law. You're working, you're harvesting grain and eating it on the Sabbath. But here's the truth. Even though the, the Pharisees were saying, hey, the picking is harvesting, the rubbing is grinding, and the, and the blowing off is the widowing, they completely missed the point. These guys, despite being experts in the law, despite being so well read, had totally forgot where we got the Sabbath from and where we get the Sabbath from. The Sabbath doesn't come from Exodus. Where's the Sabbath come from? 
That's right, Genesis. The first Sabbath was instilled by God at creation. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Moses writes, he says, On the seventh day God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from his work of creation. The Sabbath was given to us as a day of rest. See, God knew that if we didn't have his example to follow, we would work ourselves into the ground. We'd forget who provided life for us. We'd forget that there needs to be a day of worship and of rest. Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, that the Sabbath was not made to meet the needs of the people. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people, not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The Pharisees missed this. They didn't realize that the Sabbath was made for man, not man was made for the Sabbath. They had missed it. But guess what? They didn't just miss this. They missed something else. They missed Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 20. And right there it says that when you enter a neighbor's field, you may pluck the heads of grain with your hands, but you not must harvest it with a sickle. Right in Deuteronomy, Jesus is actually obeying a, he's, he's not breaking a law, he's following a command. This was prescribed by God on the Sabbath. So we have nothing to fear about Jesus breaking the laws here. He's not, right? But in the eyes of the Pharisees, they were. But let's not be too hard on these Pharisees. Let's not be too hard on them. Because I think we can totally act like these Pharisees. You ever been stuck in traffic? And there's like a whole line of traffic, and then there's that one lane that kind of has to merge way up ahead, right? And you're like, I'm going to sit here. I'm not going to get in this lane that has to merge in in 200 feet. And what is everybody doing on this lane? They're coming and passing you, and you are getting what? angry. Is there a law that says you can't do that? No. But guess what? There is a law that says you can't do that. Like common decency says you don't do that. What if you go to the grocery store? Are you the guy that leaves your cart just kind of like right by your car out there in the middle? Are you that guy? Maybe you are. And if you are, I'm going to pray for the repentance of your sins because that is evil. Okay. Like you got to take that cart all the way back and put it in the container, right? What about blinkers? Uh Uh-huh. Like, there's people in this town, there's people in this church that don't know what a blinker is. And if you're behind this person who either has his blinker on too long or doesn't put his blinker on at all, what goes on in your heart? The law of you got to turn off that blinker. Right? It even happens in my very own home. My children last night, my youngest daughter was playing a game, Phase 10. It's a card game. She was playing it all by herself. She was kind of dealing it out. She was stacking the deck. She was playing by herself. My son got so angry at her because she wasn't playing it the right way. We do it all the time. We want the rules followed. We want our rules followed. There's a game we like to play in church, and here as humans, it's called gotcha. Gotcha, you're not obeying the laws, and when you don't obey the laws, I want you punished. We love pointing out the failures and the shortcomings of what we think needs is broken. See, I can picture this story. I can picture Jesus. I can picture Jesus and Peter, and Peter sitting there just kind of stuffing his mouth full of grains, right? And all of a sudden, he looks up and he notices there's some Pharisees headed his way. And Peter's head drops. He's like, oh, oh man, they look really mad. It looks like we're going to be in trouble again. And then you hear Jesus just very gently says, you keep eating, Peter. I'll take care of it. Let's see how Jesus takes care of this. Because this is where I fall in love with Jesus all over again. Luke chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Jesus replies to the Pharisees. He says, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companies were hungry? They went into the house of God and broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priest can eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Jesus asks them a question. Haven't you read your scriptures? Jesus is asking this to the church people, the ones who knew their Bible forwards and back. He says, haven't you read it? 
Jesus doesn't go back and say, don't you know where the Sabbath was created? Don't you, didn't you read that little law in Deuteronomy that says, I can do this? No, he takes them to a story about David. He takes them to a story about David that's found in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1-6, through 6, where David, the anointed king, the one who is proscribed and who is set up to be king, who's yet to be sitting on the throne, is off and running because the king who's still on the throne, Saul, is chasing him. And so David is running for his life with his merry band of misfits. And they're hungry. And they realize that as they're running and as they're hungry, there's bread but it's bread that is sanctified. There's bread that is forbidden for anyone else to eat. There's bread that sits on the tabernacle. And he goes to the priest and he says, hey, can we get some of this bread? Can we eat this? He eats the forbidden bread, the unlawful bread. And so what Jesus is trying to do, Jesus is trying to say, hey, in Scripture, there is an example of what's going on right here, right now. Jesus is saying that there's a man, a great man, a man after God's own heart that broke the ceremonial laws of God by eating the bread that only the priests could eat. And he was justified because his need outweighed the ceremonial law that was there. Jesus is also showing that scripture itself gives precedence to what he and his disciples are doing. Jesus says the point should be self-evident. The Sabbath or Sunday is to serve man, not to master man. He says it Mark chapter 2, verse 27, we just read this. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The crazy thing is, and I think Jesus knew this, the similarities between these two stories are massive. Here's David, the anointed king, who's yet to be on the throne, who's out running for his life with his merry band of companions. And here's Jesus, the anointed king, who's yet to be on his throne, who's out doing what? Wandering with his merry band of companions. David ate the consecrated bread because he was the king of Israel and his need outweighed the ceremonial law. Jesus is saying, we get to eat the grain because I am the king of David. And look what he says next. He throws his biggest trump card on the table, and this is where the Pharisees probably lost their mind. Luke doesn't tell it, but he probably lost their mind. Luke chapter 6, verse 5. And Jesus added, the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Okay, literally, we could stop here and camp out for the next two months just on this one sentence. The Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Of all the nicknames that are in Scripture... The Son of Man is the third most popular nickname that is used for Jesus. Number one is the Christ, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah. That's not his last name. I hate to break it to you all. Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. It's Jesus the Messiah, okay? The second nickname that people always seem to call Jesus is Lord. The third is Son of Man. I believe it shows up about 98 times or 89 times in the pages of the Gospels in the New Testament. And you know who is the one who is always saying it? Jesus. This is the way Jesus describes himself. The Son of Man. Now, all of you are Bible-believing Christians, so you that completely understand that Jesus is fully man and fully God, so that when we say Jesus is the Son of God, that's speaking to his divinity, but when we talk about Jesus being the Son of Man, we think that's talking to his humanity, right? And well, part of that is true in its simp- most simple form. The reality is, is that when Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, he is claiming divinity. He is claiming that he is the divine chosen one of God. He is referencing back to Daniel chapter 7. It is crazy that Jesus says this. He is saying, the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath. He is saying, I am the boss, and I get to make the rules. I'm Lord even over this. And so what my guys are doing is cool with me because I set this thing up. I was there in Genesis. I was there when my dad spoke this thing into creation. In fact, I was the word that spoke it into creation. John's gospel bears witness to that. 
the first few verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Right? It is crazy to see what Jesus is doing in this moment. The magnitude of this statement probably floored these Pharisees so far back that they had no idea what just happened to them. It is amazing that Jesus says he is Lord of the Sabbath. And yet we treat the Sabbath the way we do. Again, I don't want us to be too hard on the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees loved the Sabbath. They loved the Sabbath laws. And in fact, they went over and above and beyond to obey Sabbath laws. We today take the complete opposite approach. What do we do today? We kind of ignore the Sabbath. We ignore taking a day of rest. We ignore taking a day to come and worship. In fact, Vic has said it a bunch of times. The average attendance of your church goer who considers himself a member of a church is one to two times a month. One to two times a month. We are pulled in so many different directions. From sports to jobs, the first thing to go on Sunday mornings when we've had a long, busy week is like, man, I'm free in Jesus. I'm not coming to church. We throw the Sabbath on the back burner. And so Jesus' statement that the Son of Man is Lord over the Sabbath, that Jesus has the authority over the Sabbath, should make us begin to question. If Jesus has authority over the Sabbath, does Jesus have authority over my Sabbath? Is my Sabbath subject to Jesus? Can I put my life on hold? Can I put my life on hold and rest and worship in what Jesus has done for me? Can I spend time worshiping and relaxing in the finished work of Jesus? These are hard questions. And if your answer is, yeah, I need to do that, then you need to be here. You need to make this a commonplace. You need to make this a priority in your life to show up and to worship with brothers and sisters, to share your problems, to meet in connect groups, and to meet for Valentine's Day, and to go and help with Beyond 90 and Kim's Open Door and Isaiah House. You need to get out and do life with other people. You need to step in. Does Jesus have authority over your Sabbath? And if we believe Jesus is the Son of Man, that He is God, that He is our personal Savior, then we should answer with a resounding yes. You tell me what to do, Master, and I will do it. Okay. So that's the first story. All right? Let's take a breath, and we'll get to the second story. Before we take a breath, let me tell you a quick little story. And I know some of you kids are in here, and some of you kids are ruffians, right? Some of you kids like to get into it a little bit, right? Especially Junior over here. A mom had two sons. They were wild and crazy, right? And this mom was a church-going mom. She decided, hey, you know what? I need to get my boys right with Jesus. So I'm going to take these two boys, and I'm going to take them to the pastor, and I'm going to have them sit down with the pastor and have them talk to the pastor because maybe the pastor can get them to understand that they need to change their ways, that they need to start living for God. So the pastor says, yeah, mom, I'll, I'll take a look at him. So he brings the first son in. He has a son sit in his office. He begins to ask him questions. And he begins to ask him the question, hey, son, where is God? And the boy's like, I, I don't know. He's like, no, no, where is God? And he asks him again, I, I don't know. And he asks him the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, where is God? Where is God? And the pastor's trying to pull out of him that God is everywhere. God can see all he does. And he keeps pulling. And the pastor's frustrated beyond all belief. The pastor says, fine, listen, you're obviously not getting it. I'm done with you. Go out there and get your brother. And so this son walks out into the hallway to get his brother, and he goes, as he sees his brother, he says, hey, listen, pastor is really angry. The brother goes, what, what, what's he angry about? And the brother who had just been in the meeting with the pastor looks at his other brother and says, man, he's misplaced God, and he thinks we stole him. See, the truth is, is that they missed the whole point of the conversation. And in the second part of this story, the second story that we're about to read, we're going to see that the Pharisees missed the point of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was here for us. It was given as a gift to us to rest in the Lord. But it was also given so that we could get the mercy of God. 
So let's read this second story again. On another Sabbath, a man with a deformed hand was in the synagogue while Jesus was teaching. The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees watched Jesus closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned on accusing him of working on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to the man with the deformed hand, come here and stand in front of everyone. So the man came forward. All right, so we have Jesus teaching in the synagogue, we have the Pharisees, and we have a man with deformed hand. We know how this is going to play out, right? Like, we literally know how this is going to play out. We have Jesus, we have the Sabbath, we have Pharisees who are mad, and then we've got a guy with a deformed hand. Now, the best part is, is Luke tells us what hand was deformed. Maybe because Luke was a doctor, maybe Luke cared about that stuff. I don't know, but I love that Luke tells us it's his right hand that's deformed because I'm sure there's some significance in there, but we don't have time to go into it, so I'm not going to go into it. But his hand was withered. Think of a root. Think of a, a branch that is dead. It's withered. And I'm sure you're sitting there going, Joe, what's the deal, man? Why can't Jesus just heal on the Sabbath? Why can't these Pharisees just let it go? Or remember those Sabbath laws we were talking about before where you're not allowed to eat on the Sabbath or work on the Sabbath or do anything on the Sabbath or even push an elevator button on the Sabbath? Well, guess what? They got it about healing too. That's right. They got it about healings. The rabbis had determined that it was a violation of Sabbath law to make anyone better. All right? That means to help anybody, to bind anybody's wound, to bring anybody chicken noodle soup on the Sabbath was against the law. No physicians could help patients. No relatives could help friends. You couldn't help a person who was ill on the Sabbath because it was considered work, right? Now, the sick person, if you're sick on the Sabbath, you just have to wait till Monday. You just got to wait. No one can come help you today. On the Sabbath was to break the law. There was no compassion, no mercy, for people in need on the Sabbath. The law trumped the needs of people. And see, the Pharisees wanted to catch Jesus in the act. They knew it. They knew who Jesus was. They knew what he was about to do. And they knew that this man with the withered hand was here. And so they were sitting there. They were lying in wait. They were excited. It's like a, 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 a predator stalking its prey, if we could translate the Greek verb out with some, some poetic license there. And as this is all going on, Luke tells us that Jesus knew exactly what was going on in the mind of the Pharisees. Wouldn't you like to know what's going on in the mind of the people who are trying to do bad to you? Man, if I knew that kind of stuff, if you knew that kind of stuff, we would, like, we'd rule the world, wouldn't we? Like, it'd be so cool. Like, I'd love to know that. Now, I wouldn't act like Jesus acts. I'd probably say something or do something completely different. But man, I would love it. Luke tells us that Jesus knows exactly what's going on in their brains. And so he asks the man with the withered hand to come down. See, that's not how I would have acted. I would have blasted the Pharisees right there. Would have called them a brood of vipers, probably kicked them out of the church, started making a whip, kicked them. Like, I would have went just nuts on them. But no, Jesus is gentle. And so he asks the man with the withered hand to come down. And then he turns to the Pharisees and asks them a question. A simple question that drives deep into their hearts. He basically says, which is it that please, which of us pleases God? Is it you or is it me? I want to help this man. You Pharisees want to destroy me. And after he asks that question, he just lets it linger in the air. He just lets it sit. Has anyone ever done that to you? Has anyone ever asked you a question and then just lets it hang there for a little bit? That's what Jesus does here. He doesn't just let the question hang. He then begins to look at them all. He begins to look at each of them slowly. Now, you're going to be like, Joe, what's this look? Y'all know this look. It's that look your mom gives you when she knows exactly what you're thinking. It's that look your wife or your husband gives you when they catch you in that thought or in that idea. They catch, like, it's that look of just like, man, I know exactly what's going on inside of you. 
It's that look. And Jesus gives it to him. I mean, he nails them. Not with the, just as a question, but with the question, the lingering, and the look. I mean, here they are thinking they're obeying the Sabbath laws while they're plotting to murder Jesus in their hearts. It's amazing, isn't it? Jesus calls them out exactly where they are and what they're doing. And then Jesus does the most beautiful thing that he could possibly do. But the Pharisees, because they're so caught up in their shame, they're so caught up in in who they are and what they want to do to Jesus, that they miss this miracle that's going to happen right in front of their eyes. Jesus tells this man with the withered hand to do something this man hasn't been able to do in years. Now, church tradition says that his right hand, he was a stonemason, that his right hand was his way he made his living. I don't know if any of that's true. I just know that he has a withered hand and he hasn't been able to straighten it out in forever. And so Jesus tells him to hold out your hand. That thing that has brought you so much shame, so much ridicule, the eyes that look at you because of your withered hand, go ahead and hold it out. Hold it out for the world to see. And as this man holds it out, guess what happens to it? It becomes whole. It becomes whole. And instead of celebrating this miracle, the Pharisees are filled with rage and they hate it. They absolutely hate it and they hate Jesus for it. Now listen, again, let's not be too hard on these Pharisees because I think we act a lot like them. We can get so wrapped up in what we think church looks like or even what faith looks like or being faithful looks like that we can miss the miracles of God saving and restoring people all around us. We don't like it when Jesus heals someone that we think deserves complete wrath. We don't like that. We don't want to hear stories of forgiveness unless we deem that person is truly sorry and truly repentant. We don't want to hear that. What we and the Pharisees seem to forget is that the Sabbath is a day of mercy. It's a day where we are shown the mercy of God just like this man with the withered hand. It's a day where we're reminded that we were restored and made whole by remembering what Jesus, what God has done for us. But it's also a day where we not only get to receive mercy, but where we get to give it right back out. So how are you receiving the rest and the mercy on the Sabbath? How good good are you at offering mercy to others? Something for you to sit in. Hosea 6.6 says, I want you to show love and not offer sacrifices. I want you to to know me more than I want burnt offerings. Psalm 51.17 says, The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Romans 10.4 says, For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Because of Jesus, every law has been fulfilled. Because of Jesus, you have mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace, love upon love, so that you can rest free and clear. A sigh of relief and go, it's done. I can stop trying and I can just start loving and living. Hebrews 4, verses 1 through 3 really kind of sets this all up. It says, God's promise of entering His rest stands still. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. For this good news that God has prepared this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. 
for only we who believe can enter his rest. Without Jesus, we are burdened to a life of trying to uphold the law. Without Jesus, we don't understand what mercy is. And we just add law upon law. And even what was given as a gift becomes a burden. So today, let us come and rest in the Lord of the Sabbath. Let us come and cast our cares on to the Son of Man, who is the Lord of not only the Sabbath, but the Lord of all. And let us rest in the mercy that he has shown a wretched sinner like me and like you. Let us remember what he's done for us. One of the ways we are encouraged to remember what he's done for us is the way that Jesus established when he was on earth. See, Jesus is all about. And band, you can make your way back up here. And so Jesus gave us a way to remember. He gave us communion. Now, we do communion a little differently here at Emmaus, and if this is your first time, we have communion stations on the sides up here and one in the back. And what we encourage you to do is to, when you're ready, to get up and grab a little piece of bread and a little cup and to just step aside and reflect with your family, with some people you came with. Just reflect on what this means and what this is. Because the problem is, is that we forget all the time. And so this is a way for us to remember. So as we get ready to, to, to head up and take this communion, let's pray together that we don't forget. Let's pray together that we can receive this mercy and that we can give it back out. Heavenly Father, your Son told us to come all who are weary and you will give rest. Father, we're weary, we're tired, we're broken. Father, we're a mess. And so, Lord, as we begin to take this cup and take this bread, allow us to remember that it symbolizes and that it is your body and blood that was broken for us. Your blood that was shed for us so that sins could be forgiven. That it was because of you that we are made right now with God. Father, your son also said that the one who the son sets free is free indeed. So let us eat this bread and drink this cup as free sons and daughters of God. Let us reflect. Let us rejoice. And Lord, let us rest in the finished work of Jesus. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. When you all are ready.